And, you know, bringing up these stories of my own stories is what is the screwdriver I use to open them up. Yeah. What is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Phoenix Rising is a medical practice, uh, downtown Salem, just south of downtown. And we've been around for six years, but the whole purpose behind it is um, trying to deliver health and wellness to people on an individual level. And we recently stopped accepting insurance that continue to be a barrier between us and our patients. So a barrier that didn't, doesn't really need to be there. And we can kind of talk about that a little bit, but, um, we do all primary care. So it's kiddos up until the, the very end. Um, and the, the goal for what we want to do is really, uh, we have a passion for working on healthy habits. So instead of just doing like 15 minutes in a prescription pad for people, when they come in, it's trying to sit down and figure out, well, what's going on with your lifestyle? You know, what are you eating? How are you pooping? What's your mental health look like? What does your sleep look like? What are your relationships, your connections, things like that. So, um, one of the things that's really interesting that I learned about when I was looking into a business model is looking at something called the blue zones. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -mm. So there are places around the world that have the highest concentration of people who live to be, um, a hundred or more. And all of these places, I think there's one in like Japan, California, Italy, um, don't quote me. I can't remember all Costa of them. Rica. <laughs> Costa Rica. Um, and these places, um, they all have something in common. And, and some of the things that they have in common is their work-life balance, their nutrition, um, and their connection with people. Mm. Um, and, um, that is something I think, you know, in, in our area with our culture, how fast paced we are. That's one of the first things I think that people lose or end up saying, okay, I'll table that for later. Um, and, and there's some sort of an interesting, um, I find a lot of people have some kind of a, uh, like almost a pride in how busy they are mm-hmm. and how hard they're working and, and all of the, which is all great. Those are all great things, but the, probably the very end, the very last thing that people talk about is like, yeah, I just had a very slow, nice day, peaceful day with my family or, or, or just different, you know, different types of like interconnected relationships. Um, so that was one of the things that really stood out to me when I was looking into all of those. I'm Mm -hmm. like, man, these people have connection. And then you throw in that we just went through a pandemic. And so at baseline, I think a lot of us struggle with mental health and our physical health. And then the last two years, there's just been this explosion of, you know, depression, anxiety. Um, I'd say that majority of my patients are struggling with higher cholesterol than they've ever had insulin resistance, just things where they're like, I don't know what's happening. I'm falling apart. And it's like, well, in general baseline, we're, we're not the healthiest culture. And then you compound that by something like a worldwide pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it's just like torched, you know, this like embers and coals that are kind of simmering under the surface. So, yeah. so all that to be said, our, our clinic really, um, it started in 2016, um, family practice and, and trying to get it where we're meeting people where they are and, and partnering with them in that journey. We don't go faster pace than the, what they're willing to go to. Um, but we also give them a lot of different options outside of medicine. So lifestyle nutrition supplements, things like that. Hard love if they want some hard love. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said um, there was a roadblock with insurance, what what does that, uh, what does that mean? And um, I mean, like me, I, I didn't even know this lane existed. Uh, mm-hmm. All I think is I have insurance and then here's my insurance. I give it to the doctor. How does that work with you? Like, how are you, how are you guys set up? If someone's not using insurance, mm-hmm. how does that work? Joel, yeah. So, would you like to explain this? <laughs> there's a so we started in 2016. I'll kind of give some backstory so that way you, um, you can understand the problems that we're trying to solve with what we're doing right now. So in 2016, we um, take an insurance like every clinic does, and we set up these parameters where we said, you know, Salem is a bigger pie than what we can chew on, and so how do you know? when you've reached your limit on the slice. And we said, well, we want to keep our same day. So if a patient has an acute issue that we'll see him within 24 hours and a follow-up, if Danielle needs to see a patient again, 
um, within within a, a week. And so we started growing with insurance, and then we got to a place where we can't see our same days within 24 hours, or we can't see our follow-ups within mm. a week. And those principles were something that we weren't willing to um, negotiate on. And so we decided, well, let's stop taking new patients. This is the slice of our pie. And when we did that, it cut our reimbursement down by 50%, and it made it unsustainable for us to keep going on insurance not 15 percent five zero yeah so just, just to be clear it wasn't enough it wasn't right. enough for us to keep going and right. um so I, we start researching um business models around the country and there's this business model called a direct primary care and direct primary care is a simple um it's a direct financial relationship between the patient and the provider so there's no third-party payer interfering with primary care relationship and what that allowed was for Danielle to um, practice her full autonomy and also such so the patient has very reliable access to her. And so when they need something, they can get to her. And when they need to communicate with her, they can communicate with her. And so patients pay a membership of $70 and they get this access. Well, come to find out, employers... We're looking for the same thing because right now they're paying these incredibly high premiums mm -hmm. and they're not getting anything for it. In fact, their employees keep complaining my deductible is five thousand dollars. So when I get when I get hurt, I still got to pay up to five thousand yeah. dollars before any before a, someone will start paying my bills. Mm -hmm. Whereas with this, you're already paying for it, and so as soon as you get hurt, you don't have to pay any more money. It's right there for you, and so it's a good tool both for individuals and for employ employers to use to kind of give access to the medical f to the medical care that they need and mm -hmm. it gives this ability for Danielle to connect with her patients like she needs to so there's no barriers there gotcha okay um how long did that take you guys to figure that out like when you research this business model because it's like something I wouldn't even have you know like for me I just go, well, this is the only way it's done. And I wouldn't yeah. even have thought like, maybe there's a way not to do insurance with this. I feel like we should back up to 2015 when I graduated from uh, my nurse practitioner program. We, I went to work for a classic medical clinic in, in Salem. Okay. So what you would expect when you go to the doctor's office, right? And went to work there. I had these big dreams and visions of being able to help people with their health and wellness. I had this glorious six month <laughs> honeymoon period of time where I was like, okay, this is great. I'm helping people. I'm serving people. And then after the six month mark, um, unbeknownst to me, I, I wasn't on what a normal provider schedule looks like. I was on the orientation schedule, right. As a new practitioner. So at that six month mark, it was like the rug got ripped out from under me and I was seeing patients every 15 minutes. Mm. I was getting double booked. A patient would no show in the morning and they tack it on to, to a space and time in the afternoon that already had patients. And, and the ex, when I asked about that, I was like, what's going on? I was so confused. I was very naive. <laughs> and they're like, well, you had a no-show this morning. And I'm like, but that space and time no longer exists. Like, I'm so confused <laughs> right now. So then it just perpetuated this issue of, like, my patients waiting in the waiting room because there's somebody that's, you know, slipped in in front of them, et cetera. So by the time I get to see my patients, and, and I'd been working at that for a year to a year and eight months, during the course of that time, I'd missed out on my family activities, kids sports. I gained 30 pounds. Mm. Um, I became pre-diabetic mm. and nothing in my life had changed as far as I've always been a good eater. I love my vegetables, you know, sleep, um, movement, exercise. The one thing that changed was my quality of life and my work-life balance and my happiness and sense of fulfillment with my work. And I felt like I had no control over that piece of my life. And part of my big purpose in going back to school, because my background is ICU nursing, bedside nursing, which I loved, but I wanted more autonomy. And here I was like, I have no autonomy. I have no control over my schedule, how I see my patients when I see my patients or my family. So 
Um, so I got to the point where, you know, it's like frustrating tears as I walk through the door coming home and, and then I'm like, now I'm pre-diabetic. I gained 30 pounds. What's <laughs> happening? And Joel, thank goodness. My husband is so supportive. He started helping me figure out, like, I have to do something different. You know, it's like, I, I got to the point where like, that's it. My favorite job I've ever had was working at Starbucks. I'm going to become a barista <laughs> where I deliver sunshine and happiness in a cup to everybody. And panic ensued on my husband's face and he's like that's not going to work with your student loans so how can we make this work this work because you love it you love mm. it you just don't love the way you're being forced and, to do it you know it. she's complaining of the problem that every primary care provider was complaining about yep. was like i can't do this job i'm getting burned out and i was thinking like not only we cannot waste this education but there has to be a way to yeah. deliver primary care that yeah. doesn't bankrupt the provider and bankrupt the, the system yeah. and deliver value that no one sees and thinks that they're totally, you know, just unhappy with. Yeah. And so I was like, there's got to be a way to do this. There has to be a way to do this. This is valuable stuff. People will pay for this. So how can we do it? And then we started. Then we started Phoenix Rising. We got the LLC going in 2016. So we looked at private practice and people around us were like, you're insane. Private practice is going <laughs> extinct. This isn't going to work. And I'm like, we're desperate. So we're going to just leap off that cliff and figure it out, you know? But yeah, so then, uh, so then Phoenix Rising was created and then kind of just that catches us right up to where, where Joel was at as far as like figuring out, okay, well, we're going to do this kind of the way that everybody else does it with insurance and then realizing, well, we're capped because we have standards. I thought this was an overhead issue. I thought yeah. the whole problem with primary care was that they were, their pyramid was upside down mm. and that if you can just adjust how much overhead you mm -hmm. had for each provider, then you can make this thing viable. It's absolutely has not, it's so much more than just an overhead problem. It is a payer problem. And as soon as you get those insurances involved in the system, in between the patient and the provider, you're completely ruined with primary care is supposed to be. And so here we are, we're stopping taking new patients, realizing that this is not sustainable because the system is designed so that you're always taking new patients. As mm. soon as you stop taking new patients into your machine, it then, then it disintegrates because it's all about numbers. It's all about numbers into your practice and it's all about referrals out of your practice. So none of the insurance values the relationship between the patient and the provider. So how in the world do you create a system that does that? Yeah. And I just I was like, okay, I'm in another desperate place and I refuse to give up on this answer. Danielle refuses to give up on this and she's an incredible provider. Like what she delivers to people is so awesome. People love it. So how come it's not working? And it's because the payer was in the way. And so well, let's get the payer out of the way. So do we do that? Just patients pay us, you know, okay, I'll see you for 120 bucks. Or can I do this in a, well, what does the insurance do? Oh, well, you can have them on retainer. Like they can just pay you a monthly membership and now they have unlimited access to you. Bingo. That's where it's at right there. And so we start, we started that last October and uh, we're at 230 patients now. Mm. And, you know, Kira's our partner. She's at 111. So the practice is growing. And now that employers are starting to find out about this, it's, it's, gonna, it's growing even faster. And so it's a movement that's growing across the country. And um, with, with the employers and with this DPC relationship, that's yeah. really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, there's, there's probably a lot of people that, <laughs> there's so many things where you start off and you're, you you want to save the world yep. and then you just get beat up and you realize this is not what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, a lot of people just probably aren't willing to take that risk to try to go, you know, they need the paycheck. They, you know, right. and, but I, I'd have to imagine there's a lot of people that probably feel that way. Like there's gotta be another way. Mm -hmm. you, like I need, I have a mortgage and I, you know, kids or whatever, I can't leave this, but yep. there's got to be a lot of people that are thinking like there's got to be a better way. No, it's a huge this. primary care provider is a huge burnout rate. I mean, enormous. And it's because of all the things Danielle just, mm -hmm. just talked about. And so, but it's scary. It is like you said, it is scary to jump off that cliff. So when you, when you started, you were taking insurance mm -hmm. and then what, when did you stop doing that? And you said when you stopped doing that, you dropped off by 50%, 50%? Five zero. 
So, um, when we stopped taking on new patients for oh, insurance, so we were still okay. utilizing an insurance model Okay. and then we got to the point where we're like, I'm too full. I, I, I need to be able to see my patients when I want to see them. Right. Um, and not have them wait a month like everybody. Well, everybody else is making people wait three months and more sometimes. But, um, so we are like, okay, we can't take on any more new patients. And then once we said that, and our reimbursement dropped. So the business model failed. It didn't mm. work. Um, and then we figured out the DPC model. Um, we didn't create it as Joel said. So we're just kind of like m- figuring out a way to make it work for us. Um, and, and so that model, we started, um, October, just this last October, 2021. Okay. Yeah. And how's that going? It's a slower grind. Like it's just needing to educate people on yeah. what this model looks like. Yeah. Um, insurance, everyone's familiar with it. They're comfortable with it. So even if it's not the best for the person, you know, it's hard for people to leave the thing that they know. Yeah. Even though when you ask them about it, they actually don't really know what yeah, they're when getting. You, when you yeah. explain what health insurance is to someone compared to what this is, it's like a no brainer. And everyone who signed on to the clinic loves what the product, mm-hmm. but the people who've never heard of direct primary care or the people who you say, ex, you know, for employers are like, well, this is an insurance. So how does this work? And you're mm-hmm. like, you explain it to them. You're like, this is an awesome idea. Yeah. And as soon as they sign on to it, they really appreciate what it delivers for their employees. So, um, both the individuals and the employers are, are really happy with the product. So it's growing, it's going well, growing, Growing at a pace that is sustainable, I, I mean, I wish we could grow a little bit faster, but I mean, that's just, I think, a nature of the beast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in terms of growth, um, it's probably a huge hurdle uh, because people just don't really know what it is. Yep. Mm-hmm. I imagine. Yeah. So education, like we were talking about, you know, walking into a business and trying to educate someone. That, that's the hardest piece. And mm-hmm. we're trying to figure out what is the best way to educate the community without spending, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on advertising. And also advertising is a genuine. Right. So right. trying to kind of figure out what that is, is what we're working on right now. Yeah. Maybe you could start a podcast. Maybe we could start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to like think of if I'm you guys and I'm trying to... Um, like the stuff that I sell, like people usually know what it is, but I'm trying to think like if you're selling something that someone doesn't even know is a thing, how do you, and how do you get them to take it serious? Because like you said, they're so used to like, well, this is what I've always done. Like it's, it's going to take brave, brave employers. It takes mm -hmm. brave employers that really want something better for their employees. And we've had those. And once, you know, so we had the first one, which was the courthouse. They sort of said, okay, we're going to use this for our employees. And then now you can, now you can go to a different employer and say, Hey, look at this employee. Mm. They're using it. And then it spreads that way, you know, and what'll happen is, and the same thing with our patients, like word of mouth is kind of the momentum is growing with the word of mouth. Momentum is growing with the employers too. So that's some of it and then getting in front of getting in front of people a little bit to introduce yourself and introduce the product. Yeah. The other thing that's really interesting about this too, that I was learning when I was still utilizing insurance was I put in orders, you know, let's say I want to do a a metabolic, you know, workup for somebody to check for insulin resistance, heart disease risk, that sort of thing. We, I would send off my orders for labs and I'd send it over to, you know, quest Salem hospital, what have you. And then I would not know which patient would come back, but people would, would kind of come back and they'd say, why do I have this bill? And I'm like, well, I didn't bill you. I don't know why you have this bill. And then as we were learning more about it, it just depends on what people's insurance plans are. And everybody's ins- you can have Moda, but Moda has a whole bunch of different mm-hmm. plans within it. Mm-hmm. And people don't know what their insurance plan actually covers. There's this false, huge false sense of security with medical insurance that like, oh yeah, I can just go to the doctor, go get labs. And that is not true. And the very biz- bizarre thing about it too, that I was learning alongside my patients who were super frustrated was um, different... Uh, d- <laughs> when I would go to order labs, it wasn't a standard cost, like a uh, vitamin D at one lab and a vitamin D at another lab. And these different insurance plants, the vitamin D lab doesn't cost the same depending on the situation, but the equipment and 
that's used to run the blood work is the same. So I could not understand. I was, I could not understand why that discrepancy in price was there, right? Like if I go to buy a t-shirt, I want to know what the cost of the t-shirt is. Yeah. And, and if it's made the exact same way and it's the same situation, why would it be drastically different? Right. right? So that was something that was a really kind of steep, startling learning curve when we first started. Um, and, and one of the things I really value about DPC is that, um, we're able to, to work on partnerships within our community for other providers and other clinics. So an example is like with quest diagnostics, um, they partner with us cause they see our business model and we're, we're serving our community and trying to help with small businesses and cash pay people. So they give us a contracted rate. Um, and it's, inc- it's transparent. I know exactly what your labs are going to cost when you leave my office. And that never happens when you leave another clinic, you will always always get, if anything, you'll get an estimated cost. And it's all about like, depends on your insurance plan, depends on your deductible. So we've had patients where they, they also have insurance and they use the DPC and they go to get their labs drawn and they call us having a heart attack because they got a bill for $900. Mm. And then we're like, well, let's figure out what our contracted rate would be. And it drops it to $150, like hundreds upon hundreds of dollars difference. Mm it makes no sense. You know, it's like, this is insane. So that's one of my big frustrations, um, with just our healthcare system in general, there's no continuity and there's no transparency. So this business model makes it incredibly transparent. You know what you're going to get billed from our clinic. And then we work really hard to try to create those relationships so that people can financial health and wellness, right? Like they can make a plan for what they pay for. And it's so much, um, honest. Yeah better for the patient, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> almost <laughs> it's funny. Cause what we were talking about earlier with the whole idea of this almost like seems like what's the catch. So with me not really knowing this business model, <laughs> like literally I, I feel so uneducated to even I'm trying to normally I'm good at asking questions, but I'm like trying to think about like, how do I even ask what it is? So if I come to you and I'm mm. like, okay, I want to sign up. Um, what does that look like? What do you guys do? What do you not do? Mm. Um, what I'm trying to say is like, I almost don't even know and Travis, how to ask the question. Some of the, some of the reasons why it's hard to ask questions about this thing is because it's so simple, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like the only difference that you're changing is someone has to pay you one price per month and then you get access to primary care. Okay, the whole thing is explained in five seconds. So then how do you elaborate on that? Well, the elaboration comes with what are the problems that this thing fixes, right? And so you can go in and compare. That's why I was comparing kind of like traditional primary care versus direct primary care. And now now we'll get into the next thing is like, well, how does a patient even get connected to something like this. And I think those types of questions is exactly the question you should be asking. Yeah. So if I come to you and I'm like, Hey, I want to be your client. Um, is it a contract? Um, if it is a contract, uh, is there a certain period of time, Mm -hmm. um, that you have to be a part of that? Can you cancel any time? Like, how does that, Joel's got this. um, Again, this is, this is, Really rocket science. So you <laughs> call, you you look up Google Phoenix Rising Family Medicine. It will be there on the website. It'll say oh, request a new patient appointment. You click on that, and it'll send a message to us saying that you you're wanting to become a new patient. We'll send you a contract that says you understand that direct primary care isn't insurance. Mm-hmm. We'll ask you for your information as far as getting you into a chart, and then we'll ask to set up an automatic payment, and that payment can be canceled the next month if you want to. Now it's a $250 re-sign up fee, but there's no contract time frame that you have to be signed gotcha. on to the clinic. And then what'll happen is, unlike other clinics, um, we reach out to you and we say, okay, <laughs> come in and let's schedule an hour appointment just to learn about you. An not, hour. <laughs> not to, not right. to <laughs> try and fix any of your problems, but just to figure out who Travis is. Where you know. And Danielle could go into kind of some of her history taking and how she does that. But, and then 
she develops a care plan and then you get into what it is that you want to get fixed and all of that. But yeah, it's as simple as Googling Phoenix rising and clicking on, I want to become a new patient. Okay. So initial meeting, I come in, I'm seeing you. Are you always seeing the new people? Is there someone else I could see? Yeah. So great question, Travis. So with a new patient, one of the other things that was so important for me when we created the clinic was continuity of care. So I was at the other clinic, another naive learning curve for me was I just thought logically that I would be able to see my patients always. And that isn't the case. If anybody's been to their provider recently, they know that they can bounce. They won't necessarily see their provider. They bounce around to different people. And I thought that was absurd and it made no logical sense because when my patient would go see somebody else, they had no idea what I was working on with my patient. So that was something that I knew I always wanted to do was when you sign up and I'm your PCP, I'm your PCP. You see me. So we have, um, you, you would, Oh, real quick tangent about the contract. It's so important to us that there's no, um, no like set time that we have to be forcibly married together Gotcha. because, um, you know, this isn't like, I don't know what contract has that cell phone. I can't even think of one, but like yeah. you're, we're humans, right? Yeah. Like we're, I can't force you to be with me. That's mm-hmm. gross. Like that doesn't feel right. And yeah. so we wanted it to be something where somebody could sign up and be like, you know, Danny's just not for me. She's too hyper smiley, whatever. Um, and, and, they should be able to say thanks, but no thanks, Danny. Peace out. I'm gone. I'm going to go see somebody else. That needs to happen. So people need to have the freedom to do that. So that's okay. why it's like no amount of time. Cancel whenever you want. Um, so Which that, is good to know because yeah. especially in a space that isn't understood very well at mm-hmm. this point, like for me and how I think, mm-hmm. um, I'm like, maybe I'll just try. Yeah. And for then sure. like if this isn't my jam yep. or we meet or... Well, for whatever reason, like, yep, she's, she is too hyper. She was right. Yep. Whatever it is, uh, <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, well, whatever, I'm yeah. out a hundred bucks or whatever the monthly thing is. And what, you know, exactly. Yeah. That's important. So, so, so then let's say, all right, you got a hold of the website, you contacted the clinic, you got your page. So Joel does all of that kind of background work gets, gets, uh, the chart set up. You have your first appointment with me. And of, you know, I think most people are familiar with telemedicine options at this point with the COVID. Um, but you can do either in office, in person, telemedicine phone, whatever's most convenient for you. But then you and I sit down and we create your chart together. So the other piece of this, as far as continuity goes, like you don't sit in a waiting room that's sterile and uncomfortable for 30 to 45 minutes and then get called by a somebody who rooms you and then another person comes in to get your vitals and then you're waiting another 20 minutes for your provider. I come get you from the waiting room. I don't have an MA. We have um, two incredible staff. Chelsea and Lisa are brilliant office managers and you know, they help with coordinating care. Um, but my responsibility to my patient is that I see them as they walk in the door, I take them and then I, I walk them out. Um, so they are with me the entire time. So when you come back, um, we sit down and it's, it's just going through all the things that you're used to going through, but you're not having to write it on like 10 different sheets of paper and re-explain yourself 10 different times at 10 different people. So we, we get your medical history, surgical history. And then I do a lot of information gathering for, like I was talking earlier about just our work-life balance, healthy habits, nutrition, sleep, pooping, you know, all the personal questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it really helps me get an idea of what people's individual risk factors would be for you know, cancer, heart disease, all those, those things. Um, and then once we do that, um, we also, you know, want to make sure and see if there's any specific concerns that the person has. Again, another thing that was so frustrating for me in the other clinic setting was if somebody had a concern, sorry, one concern at a time, schedule another appointment, which is (laughs) ludicrous because everything's so interconnected Uh, with humans, right? It's like, Oh, you have a stomach ache, Um, but, but you're also saying that you have, you know, I don't know, constipation, come back later for your constipation. It's like, what? That's crazy. So, um, this gives me time. I do 30 and 60 minute appointments and it gives me time to be able to hear somebody's entire, you know, concern, their whole situation. Sometimes people, it's the first time they've been heard by 
by a provider and it's just like this massive hemorrhage <laughs> of like words and all of these things that come out and then sometimes that's like it they're like whoo okay, man, I feel so much better. I'm good. And I'm like, okay, are you sure? Like, oh, I think that's what I needed. So counseling session, right? I know Think about how much money they're saving. Oh, I know <laughs> from exactly. having professional counseling. Yeah. Session. And, and then the, like the confidence that they can just come back and be like, I get to see Danny again, not yeah. some stranger. Right. So, yeah. so then we also, basically we just partner together and I, I tell people like I, um, I'll never work harder than you, right? Like that's just having good respect and good boundaries. You you set the pace. I give all these options. Um, you give your priorities. I give mine. And then we compromise together and I just stay in step with you. And we we work through some of these things. And um, I have a, all different types of, of patients. Some patients are pretty... Um, uh, resistant to like classic medical care. Maybe that's, um, pharmaceuticals, you know, prescription medications, which I prescribe. We didn't even talk about nurse practitioner role in Oregon, but, um, but yeah, there, or, or, you know, so there's supplement things, there's lifestyle stuff. We really get to tailor it to the person, which is the best. I I was just thinking about like, I don't even have a primary physician. I rarely go to the doctor. I get that from my dad. He's terrible. He never goes to the doctor. Um, but you were talking about like, you get me, you. And I was thinking like, and I, I realize there's a lot of people out there that have a doctor and like, that's their person. Like, mm-hmm. But like for someone like me, it's weird to think about like, yeah, you're my doctor. Because like, I've had so many times where I, I sign up or whatever and then they leave. And then there's a new yep. person and they leave and there's a new person and they leave. Li- and my my journey with healthcare or whatnot um, is not relational at all. Mm-hmm. So it's like as you're talking, I'm thinking about my own life and how there's been so many times where they're like, "Well, they left," or yep. or or like super last, like what? Like you just to- <laughs> like I had a male doctor and now a female doctor right? walked in and like, oh, he's not here anymore. Like right? there's been so, so I don't. I don't associate for me personally healthcare with like relationship. It would be weird if I was like, yeah, I know exactly who my doctor Which is. is. Crazy <laughs> because I have a relationship with my realtor and I have a relationship <laughs> with like insurance mm-hmm. broker or mm-hmm. an attorney. Mm-hmm. This is insane mm-hmm. that when you say it is blows your mind to think that you would have a relationship with your primary care provide the person who knows literally everything about you <laughs> I, I know you, you i know can't like sit i'm down like, and just have a relationship with them i'm thinking through like all what that would look like in my own life like yeah i i know them like i actually know their kids or i like my experience is like this is some foreign person we're not going to have any kind of real conversation yeah. it's going to kind of just be a checklist um, and then here's a prescription and then poof. And, and they probably won't be here next year. Mm-hmm. That is my experience. Um, and therefore, I mean, I don't have a primary mm-hmm. doctor, um, mm-hmm. right now. Like I was just thinking about that. I'm like, yeah, I don't have a person, but then I was thinking, why don't I have a per I'm, th- I'm thinking of like what you're saying, mm-hmm. the experience is, and I'm like, why don't I have a person? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, something you said early on. How um, with like health and wellness um, that in our society or culture, like I was just thinking, how funny would it be rather than all the social media posts about like, check out my new Ferrari or my boat or my whatever. (laughs) Like if people were like, look how healthy I am. Yeah. Look like, look how... I mean, I, I guess there's a lot of like. Well, it wasn't in a vain way. It was like that's what I was. I was, yeah. I was about to say there's a lot of like fitness ones where like mm-hmm. I mean, some of it is solid or they're trainers or whatnot. But then there's a lot of like, just look at me. Mm-hmm. But but in in a, in an authentic like, because you were talking about this pride in like working so much or overworking. Yep. How, and I'm thinking, why is that? Why is that like? oh my gosh, I was at the office for 80 hours, but you weren't home with your wife and your kid or your whoever's, um, and, and what they were suffering Mm -hmm. and and you're so proud because you were putting in all that time. If we flipped it and like, man, I got to spend so much time with my loved ones. 
Um, and that's just something I do as a means to an end. But then, but I was thinking about like, <laughs> like how foreign, like I'm like, it'd be weird if I knew exactly who my doctor was. And and then it's like, how crazy is that? Like you just said, like, well, I know my realtor. I know my insurance person. I know, you know, these things that like. And I'm the one that does a pap and checks vaginas <laughs> and bums and penises. No and I'm penises. Like, right? <laughs> no. Right? I'm just like, what? I like hear people's most intimate, vulnerable. I know. You know, I see every body part. Yeah. And then exactly what you say, right? There's, It's insane to yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm... It's like, what was wrong? What was wrong in my path that you won't see me again, right? You handed me off to somebody else? <laughs> I mean, it, like, I'm, it's really funny to me that I'm... I'm Because I'm just personalizing it for me in my experience and whatnot. And then, like, that would be really weird if I really knew my person. Right? And they really knew yeah. me. And, like, next year, they were there. And the following year... But how right they, does that feel? I know. Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, as we're laughing about it, I'm like, this is dumb that I'm not. Like, what am I like? What? Like, I'm saying these things and then I'm listening to what I'm saying. This is dumb, especially when you made the analogy of like, hey, I know these mm -hmm. and not that insurance people aren't important or whatnot, but it's not the same, though. No. It's it's not this. These other you things your, are the pat and like, <laughs> right? you know what right. I'm saying? It's, like, this yeah. should be the and not your that relationship. Um, we've had experiences where this relationship has literally saved the family and the patient's dignity mm -hmm. because this relationship is extremely important. And when it's lost, we see it all the time in the ICUs where you have patients who are getting all these treatments done to them or people in the hospital, they're getting all these treatments done to them. And no one in that hospital mm -hmm. building knows anything about this person. Mm -hmm. It's a foreign person. And the only person that knows anything about him is the wife or the daughter yeah. or his son that's sitting right next to the bedside, but they have no clue about the medical world. And so how can you connect the two worlds together, want the family and the personal relationship and their needs, the patient's needs, with the medical knowledge that is coming through so they can make the best informed decision. And that is this relationship. And so as this thing goes on, not only is it good for like, oh yeah, when I break my arm, I got someone to go to. But when I'm in the hospital and my family's trying to make a decision on something, there's someone there to get my back that yeah. is an advocate to kind of say, hey, this is what's been going on with this family and with this person. This is probably going to be the best move that we should make for them, you know? Yeah. And I've had, I can't go into details, but have been she's been able to sit at the bedside with family to say, hey, remember the conversations that we had about wishes? This isn't what we talked about. This is what... Mm -hmm this hospital wants you to do mm -hmm. and we can make it we can make a, ch a choice right now that really follows the values of what you know joe wanted to do and and sure enough it was that exact thing and the rest of, and allowing that natural death was the most beautiful thing because mm -hmm. of the advocacy that danielle was able to do you know and so it's it's funny to laugh about to and to even think about how crazy it is that we don't have relationships with our primary care providers but when you think about how important it is it's it's like even more insane. It's like, why don't we have these relationships? This is insanity. It should yeah. be like, and it was like that back in the day when right. your doctor had to right. get on a horse right. and come over to your house. <laughs> yeah. Then there was a relationship, but yeah. now that you could just pick up the phone, there's no relationship anymore. Yeah. This is nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, like for me, cause I'm, I've been sitting here thinking like, why don't I have a doctor? And I think it's because of my experience with mm -hmm. this, not right. a doctor, but the system, and if you will, the doctors. where, yeah, mm -hmm. not, not anything in particular, but mm -hmm. just the, oh, now it's this person. Now, I mean, yes. literally there was one time where, uh, be, between the time I was seen and then I was seen again, I got a letter that, okay, it's not this person. <laughs> <laughs> now you have this person. And then I got a letter that now it's not this person that right? took over for this person. It's now Number this three. person. And I'm like, I'm, th I think the reason I, I'm almost like, I don't even care then. Yeah. I, like there's no connection. There's no, like I, if something really happens, I guess I'll just go to the hospital or I'll go to ER or urgent care. Mm -hmm. Like, because there's no connection where I feel like I want to go talk to mm -hmm. you. Um, mm -hmm. cause you're my person, mm -hmm. 
you know, and it sounds crazy as I'm saying that how po- like potentially important that could be, <laughs> but like I just like have gotten numb to that of like, well, they're just gonna leave, like they're you know, yeah. Um, that- it, it almost sounds too good to be true, honestly. Mm. The stuff we were talking about, like. Like, oh, you'll advocate for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that was a creepy way you said that. Like, it, I mean, I was just thinking like, wow, how important would that be? But in my head, like, I don't associate that with it, with my experience mm-hmm. at all. Like mm-hmm. that they would really know me. Right. That they mm-hmm. would really know or, or they're too busy. If I'm over here, they got to see all the patients that they have to see. They would never be where you went to someone's bedside like or whatever like that oh it blows the nurses minds whenever the family calls their primary care provider and the primary care provider gets on the phone with the bedside nurse or with the bedside (laughs) doc and they're like what we never have a conversation with primary care provider yeah Yeah. they just yeah yeah they they tell the family how lucky they are to have such a relationship like this you know And, and it's so important too like if you're looking you had mentioned like you know that you're lacking that relationship and connection because you don't care. And it seems, you know, it's stemming from like this big overarching healthcare system that, that we have that's completely broken and, um, dysfunctional. So one of the things about that too, is that like the amount of money that we're hemorrhaging into a broken system is it's horrifying. And part of that, um, I, you know, I feel strongly is because we're missing this dynamic. Mm. Um, so when, you know, I recently, I had one of my nearest and dearest patients. He recently passed away from bladder cancer and he, um, uh, also had, um, schizophrenia. And so I knew his nuances, like I've known him for six years and we, we built a trusting relationship over the course of that time where I'll never forget the first time that I met him and compare it to right before he passed. And it went from him rightfully being scared, right? I'm sure there's a lot of stigma for, for people when they have different health conditions and very scared to come and meet me. And then at the end knew that I was a hugger and would just automatically hold his arms out for a hug. Right. And he's, and it would be like, I'm not leaving until I get my Danny hug. And so it was just like such a cool transition to see him be able to kind of sink into an area of like trust and vulnerability with somebody that was in a role that was so important as, as supporting his health and wellness. Well, he ended up going into the hospital, um, because his bladder cancer came back. He had been in remission. It came back and, and part of, um, he always had this, this fear, like as we talked over the course of time, um, this fear of death. And then the more that we talked over the course of time, it was peeling back those layers and it was not a fear of death. It was a fear of suffering, Mm. um, which anybody could, could agree with that. Right. And, and so when you, when he, it got to the point where he'd call and we'd know something's not right. We need to go check on him. So Joel did a home visit cause I was, I was seeing patients all day and I'm like, I need someone to lay eyes on him. Joel, for anybody listening, he's a nurse <laughs> licensed, <laughs> right? Oh, that's important to note. Cardiac ICU background. Uh, we didn't even talk about his background, but, uh, anyways, Naval Corman, he's got a lot of, he's licensed. Yes. He's licensed. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm like, Joel, help me out. Like, can you go over to his house and check on him? Something's wrong. Joel goes, checks on him, you know, collects urine and is like, Hey buddy, I see a big blood clot in here. How long has this been going on? Oh. And my, my sweet patient's like, Oh, what? No, that's new. That hasn't been oh. happening. So he gets, um, hospitalized. So he, he goes into the ER. He's admitted, um, for any medical person that hears this, his hemoglobin was three. Was it mm-hmm. three? Which yep. is... I don't know how he was living. It's, it's so anemic, so much blood loss that I knew like, there's no way, obviously that wasn't brand new. It's been going on for months. What should a normal number be? I have no idea. Over 10. Yeah. Yep. Over 10. So, um, so anyway, so he gets into the hospital and I'm, I'm getting these, um, notes and it's like, Oh, you know, um, bladder cancer looks like it's back, but his hemoglobin, you know, it can't be explained by this, et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're going to do a colonoscopy. We're going to do all these things. And I'm like, wait, what's going on? So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go see him and check in and see what's happening. So I, I go to the, 
ICU. I go visit him at the bedside and then I go talk to the nurse and I'm like, let's talk about the last six years of this guy's life. So here's what's going on, you know? Um, and, and at the end of it, the nurse is like, oh my gosh, we're doing all these things that we probably shouldn't be doing. And I'm like, yeah, it's a big waste of his comfort, right? Like this isn't what his care plan is. He wants to be kept comfortable. He doesn't want to suffer. And also all of those things that you're doing to what end he's, he's got terminal cancer, you know? So why don't we get him resources with palliative care hospice and not do colonoscopies and all these invasive procedures that cost a lot of money. So it was just this, this incredible honor to be able to go in and see him at the bedside. And I sat down with him and it, we, you know, we both knew like, okay, this is kind of it. Like you've been battling this for six years. And I, you know, he, we grabbed onto each other's hands and I just said, you know, I said, are you scared? And he said, you know, I'm not scared. I've just been scared that I'm going to suffer. And I don't feel that I'm going to suffer now, you know? And, and I think it just took all that time of building a relationship for him to know that I was going to battle anybody who would do something that he wouldn't want. Yeah. Um, I was his advocate. I yeah. was going to be a fierce advocate and I showed up for him. And so, um, we helped him and I talked with the family. We transitioned him from the ICU to home on hospice. I visited him. Um, once he got home the week that he died, went in, he was in his bed, lifted his arms up. As soon as he saw me, I gave him our one last hug. And I said, are you in pain? Are you comfortable? He's like, I feel great. And I said, okay. And then a couple of days later he passed. So it was perfect for him. It yeah. was perfect. Yeah. You know, and that's like every primary care has the, um, you know, we have the option of being in that position, but it's so blocked and clouded by the structures that we work in. And it's why we do what we do and it's being held from us. Yeah. So man, yeah. you're a doctor that gives hugs, a nurse practitioner <laughs> that gives hugs. <laughs> mm. They call it Dr. Danny. Even that, like I was just thinking about like, I always correct them. If, but. if you nurse practitioner, <laughs> mm-hmm. If you gave me a hug, I come in and we talk or whatever, and then you hug me. Even like that experience, I'm like, that's funny to me, right? Because <laughs> I've I've never had someone yeah. hug me. Like it, it, I almost I almost think of it like you wouldn't do that. Like uh, in that's my experience. Mm-hmm, it would be mm-hmm. like, well, we would never hug. Like mm-hmm. we wouldn't actually know each other. Yeah, that's yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I think too. Some of this like is um. And, and doctors are sensational, amazing, brilliant. Um, but the, the two tracks in, in, in health and in medicine, it's very different. So doctor, you know, they go through, um, medical school and their residency and all of that. And then my track was bachelor's of science degree in nursing through OHSU four year program. But then I have 10 years of bedside experience in the, in, in hospital setting, most of which was in ICU. And so that's like, hands on holding hands, wiping tears and butts. Right. And doctors, they don't have that kind of an experience. And so nurses, I think we're shaped and formed and molded differently than doctors. Both are wonderful, but it's just, it's a little bit, it's just different. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I'm a hugger, but yeah. if you don't like hugs, I'm yeah. cool with that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can high five yeah. it. We're yeah. good. Yep. So, so, okay. So first appointment, kind of like get to know, you know, what's mm-hmm. going on. Um, I mean, I guess like someone might not have anything going on. They're sure. just like yeah. checking it out. Yep. Like, so then whatever, you get to know them a little bit. And then after that, like how often could they see you during the month? Like, what yeah. does that look like? So I, a big part of this too, that I, that I talk about with people is, um, I really want to empower you to be able to advocate for yourself and empower you in taking care of your own health and wellness. If you're dependent on me and there's a codependent relationship there, that's toxic. Like that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, you can see me as much as you want, but if you're having to come and see me every couple weeks, every month, there's something that we're not doing right. Mm. And so usually, and ideally what happens is people come in, 
let's say that we, you know, um, there's some concerns. There's a lot of front loaded, heavy contact at first because we're trying to create a, a care plan and, and put some things in place that somebody can work on so that they start becoming stable. Right. And then after that, your check-ins become more infrequent, you know, maybe it's every three months, maybe it's every six. And then ideally they get to the point where it's like, you see me for your annual physical, Yes, you should be having an annual physical. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Travis. Um, I thought that was every ten years, <laughs> <laughs> right? Nope. Um, and and you and then like that's my goal is that I get people to where they see me, you know, every year. But of course, life happens, right? And so you come in when you see me. But um, but it's the goal isn't for you to be dependent on me. I want to educate you and empower you to, to feel like confident and taking care of yourself in the best way that you need to knowing that I'm always there when something weird happens. So, um, it depends on the person, the, the complications or the concerns and, we see each other as much as we need to, to get you in a good zone and okay. then fly birdie. And okay. I'm here when you need to land, you know, so no, so no technical limit, but no. obviously if it's like, I'm seeing you every week, like, hey, what's going on? Yeah, yeah that's Why happened you... a couple times. And mostly um, that was boundary setting gotcha. for, for for somebody. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, where it's like, this is not appropriate. So, okay. Yeah, but otherwise, people people know. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. What other questions am I not asking? That's a great question. Sure. Well, oh, we I know what I... To... Sorry. Yeah. I know no, what go I... Because I'll like lose we already, it. I think we um, Shoot. What, uh, what can you see patients for mm-hmm. and what do you refer out? Like, like mm-hmm. me, I don't r- really know exactly kind of like what you'll, you know, like when I, when, if there's something I'm like, Hey, this is going on and you're yeah. like, actually, we don't you do that. You'll yep. have to go. What are those? Oh yeah. Great question. Things? So, um, every, every practitioner is different in what they're, they're, um, we all have like a baseline scope of practice and then each individual practitioner tends to find a niche or something that they're comfortable in. So what, what I say for myself isn't necessarily won't hold true maybe for my practice partner, Kira or doctors or things like that. Right. So that's good to know. Um, but for, for me with primary care, Um, the things that I do, obviously we already talked about annual physicals, PAPS pelvic. So women, women's healthcare, um, I order in the state of Oregon, nurse practitioners are autonomous, so we don't have to practice under a physician. So, um, I am my own independent practitioner. So any kind of diagnostics workup. So your, um, annual labs, or when you have a concern, I can do lab work, imaging, diagnostics, treatment plans. The, the whole bit, right? I can remove toenails, warts, skin tags, abscesses, set broken bones that aren't bulging out of your skin, right? Not okay. like serious traumas, yeah. um, simple musculoskeletal, things like that. But, um, but when it comes to, um, more complicated, uh, I don't know, like, like, uh, disease processes or, or you're needing, I'm a big fan of utilizing, uh, tools when I know they're better than mine. So, because I want my patient to have the very best care and the very best options. So an example is, you know, I, we work on some musculoskeletal stuff, neck pain, uh, neck pain or back pain or something. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, um, we work on it for a little bit and you're like, man, okay. Yeah, it's kind of better. And I'm like, no, I want it to be really better. So you need to go see Nick Seward, by the way, you should talk to him. He's a physical therapist, the best. Boom. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, um, He's amazing. I send my patients to him because he's the best. I'm not a physical therapist. He's the Mac daddy of all PTs. Cash-based practice doesn't work with insurance. We have very similar style. We treat the patient hour long appointments. You don't see his assistant. It is him start to finish your care with him will far exceed any other PT experience you'll have in any other big system. So we partner a lot together because we are very similar minded and he's the best at what he does. And so when there's something that's a little bit more complicated or maybe we're not able to break through a chronic condition, then I'm like, you need somebody that's smarter than me in this. So let's find that person. And I take great pride in being able to refer to very good people. Okay. So, um, I don't hold on to somebody, um, just for the sake of holding on and wanting to be like a superhero that fixes it all, you know, yeah. that's not my job. Yeah. Um, 
So, so I always think like primary care, we know, we know a little bit about a ton of different things. Yeah. Some of us have a little bit more depth in certain areas, but people deserve to be able to go way down deep down, you know, down the well, um, when it's necessary. And it's, so if it's something that, that you're not doing, you would typically have some kind of direction mm. for like, yes. Hey, I don't do that, but. Yep. This person or that person. I got a foot guy, a heart guy. Okay. Yeah. And we would walk you through the process of making yep. sure those connections are made, okay. then following Good up point. with you and the provider mm-hmm. so that, you know, the provider understands kind of what the plan is, that Danielle understands what that provider's plan is, and then that you understand what that provider's plan is. Okay. Because people can go, they can go to the specialist, but then they are totally lost as mm-hmm. far as what they're recommending to do. So you come back okay. and Danielle does a follow up and everything. Okay. Which we should be doing. And you don't do that in a classic setting, right? (laughs) Like if I refer you to somebody because I need, we need help in our treatment plan, we should probably come back together and make sure we're all on the same page and it just doesn't happen, you know? So, right. Um, so do all your patients, most of them, not most of them still have health insurance? Mm. Uh, and this is, part of it Mm -hmm. or do some they go i don't have any Mm -hmm. health insurance now and this is what i'm doing Mm -hmm. uh because i'm just trying to think like okay is there something that might that might happen where i would need health insurance Mm -hmm. so then do i keep health insurance and and add this as well or is this something where i don't have any health insurance and i'm just doing this Yeah, these are awesome questions. I think um, it can fit in any of these scenarios, but what we recommend is that you do have uh, insurance or some sort of coverage. So medical insurance is is one part or one type of uh, financial Mm -hmm. coverage for if you, you, say, get in a car accident. There's also something called medical cost sharing. Uh, Medical cost sharing is where a group of people put money into an account that is administered by someone by, by an, an organization and we use Zion and then um, they sort of pay out claims and you have a deductible, would they call it uh, an individual unshareable amount, which is, so let's say you got in a car accident, broke your leg, you would pay say a thousand dollars. And then after that thousand dollars, the medical cost sharing would cover it at a hundred percent after that. And then so you could use it for that. You could use it for regular insurance when your deductible is really high and you're, you don't want to pay out of pocket every time you go see your doc or you just are having a hard time accessing service. So Medicare patients could use this too. Um, or if you don't have any insurance but you want to stay up to date with your health care and you want access to primary care, then you can use it in that, in that case too. Okay. I'm I'm always like a visual person. Like I'm, I'm trying to... Because I almost feel like I'm... I'm like a perfect uh, like prospect or client for this model because well, like, you know, Adrian gets health insurance through the school district. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's so, you know, that's nice because um, it's mostly paid for mm-hmm. by, by the school district. But then I'm a guy that like, I don't have a doctor. Mm-hmm. So th- then a lot of it, I'm like, I don't even use that. And then if I was to use it, I don't even know who I'm going to. Mm-hmm. So then you guys, that could be like, um, well, at least I know this mm-hmm. person. And for the stuff that isn't major medical things, because right. um, like how I am or how my dad is, is like, well, if something majorly happens to me, <laughs> then I'll go to the hospital. Like, Because yeah. I, I just don't have that relationship of like, you say annual, you know, and I'm laughing because I'm <laughs> like, you know, that's in my brain. I'm like, I don't even think like that. Like, I, hey, I should go annually get yeah. things checked out. Um, but then, I mean, for someone like me, it's like that could be a perfect fit because I don't have that connection anyways. Mm-hmm. Um and as we're joking, I know I should. <laughs> I should be checking stuff out and... um but yeah, that's what I was thinking about was like, is this something where you kind of just completely get rid of the old guard and you have this, but then, I mean, me and my insurance brain is kicking in where I'm like, well, let's cover every 
potential exposure here. Yeah. Is there going to be stuff that, you and know, for someone like you, we think that the best pairing is medical cost sharing with, with a direct primary care. Cause it's the lowest cost. Um, and then you get, you get a really good benefit, especially if you don't have any preexisting conditions, but people who have preexisting medical conditions, medical cost sharing, isn't a good fit for them because it won't pay for those preexisting conditions. Oh, okay. And, and so a person like that might have a high deductible plan, okay. and, but this would also fit with that because they still want access to care without having to pay all of that out of pocket costs. And so they would use that or say someone who has coverage at the school district where they have really good insurance low deductible even in that case you don't get a hug from your doc yeah you don't know your doc like you know <laughs> yeah. your realtor yeah and so uh, if you want a relationship where this doc knows your family and they know you then you would want to pay for something like this you know so it it fits into any of those models or any of those needs um, and it, it addresses a lot of those problems okay and you said seventy dollars a month mm-hmm for individuals, yeah. For individuals? Mm-hmm. Uh, what about families? It's 170 for families, so two adults and unlimited kids. Okay. And then for an adult couple, it's uh, 130 Okay. And for an adult with unlimited kids, it's 110 Okay. I'm, I'm like, I'm laughing inside because the stuff that I spend $100 on each month. Right. <laughs> I know. Like, we spend $100 on something last night that, <laughs> that that is the opposite of health and wellness um and you know but i'm just like there's so many things that we spend money on that you know that you look back That's and you're an like like that yeah. was pointless or that didn't really help me in any way or um because me and me and adrian we'll talk about that kind of stuff we're like isn't it funny how like what we value mm-hmm. and cause you don't really think about it in the moment. But then when you look back and you go, wow, we just spent X amount on this and yeah, that was fun for a couple hours or whatever that thing might be. But you know, it didn't moving forward. It's gone now. There's yep. no real benefit from that. And then there's other stuff where like, like for example, we don't buy a lot of groceries. Uh, and like my daughter, when we have her, it always is like, you guys don't have any food. (laughs) And, and because when it's me and her, like we don't, we're usually going out to eat or Mm -hmm. whatnot. And so like, I, like, I don't value groceries that like, I'm always like, and granted everything is ridiculously about like three pounds of ground beef for like $17 the other day. But, um, but I like, I think about that value and I'm like, you know, oh my gosh, 150 bucks for this, these mm-hmm. groceries or whatever. But then I think about other stuff that I spent 150 bucks on and I'm like, the grocery was, would be so much <laughs> more beneficial than what I just spent that 150 bucks on. Yeah. And like, that's how I'm, I'm thinking about like, this is like, I, you don't do it. So like right now I don't have the, the dollars going out to it, you know? So the first thing is like, well, I'm not, spending the money on that right now so i don't know but then when i think about the stuff that i spend money on and then i'm like compared to how important this is um yeah that that's like for someone like me i'm like (laughs) i don't know it is like this sounds so as i'm saying these things these sound dumb and like thinking about like how do I not have it's a like doctor? It's like a paradoxical... Uh, I know, like, I know. because as, a, as I'm understanding the business model and whatnot, it's like, why, why do I minute. not do this? Like, yeah. what is wrong with me that I'm... that? Because it, it seems like, well, no, duh, you should do this. But then I'm like, I don't have a doctor. <laughs> like, I don't, I can't even tell you when well, I, when I last I, had a doctor. Like, you'll wait until something happens. Exactly. And then the yeah. cost really goes up, yeah. right? And so people aren't valuing their health, right? Like, they're healthy now. Value that you know, protect it. And sorry, I totally like made the motion of cutting you <laughs> yeah. off. Right. I'm like, idea. It's exploding in my head. But exactly what you're saying is that they don't value it. And then suddenly something happens and like Travis, like I'll use you as an example. Yep. Right. Go ahead. So in our 20, even kids, which is shocking, but that's the way we are right now. Twenties and thirties, right. And forties, we are actively creating cardiovascular disease. I'm actively clogging my arteries like right now. And we at, I'm 37 years old. Like I, 
typically people in my age range, right? 20s, 30s, 40s, we're not thinking about a heart attack, yeah. right? We're like, okay, let's pay a bill or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as we eat our ice cream and quick cheeseburgers, because we're in a hurry, right? Because our work-life balance is mm-hmm. terrible, right? So Because we're so proud we work so much. Because we're so proud, right. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, I have people come in and they're like, I retired and my life fell up, my body fell apart, right? Like I just got to the point where my kids are out of the house and I can start living, you know, not living my life because my kids are gone, but having these other opportunities. And then I had a heart attack, you know, men and women, and now I have diabetes and it's like, yeah, I, let me help you with that. But dang, I wish I could have seen you in your twenties, yeah. you know, thirties, forties, yeah. because we are making disease right now. We just aren't going to see the heart attack for another 20 years. Yeah. And in 20 years, I'm still young, you know, like, yeah. So anyways, yeah. I'm very passionate about that. And I mean, that. once you, once something shows up, then you lose opportunities to take advantage of prices that what medical cost sharing has. Because right. if you take advantage of these costs now, they'll pay for <laughs> something that happens. But if something happens, then now you can't take advantage of these costs. Like with it's, insurance stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'm like thinking of marketing for you guys right now. Like in my head, because... Like I'm, I'm like picturing a graph of like w- what I spend money on to be like, <laughs> here's how much money I spent last year on this thing, uh, <laughs> that really gave no benefit, mm-hmm. um, compared to, you know, like $1,500 a year. Uh, mm-hmm. what, how much was for married? So- it's 170. For, 170? Oh, for a married couple, it's yeah. 110. I mean, no. 130. Sorry. I think it's 130. It's 130. Okay. Yeah. So 1,500 bucks. So, I mean, in a year's time, honestly, yeah. that like, I don't actually, I never get coffee, but as I you're told, sitting next I, I to me, you're like you hiding that, it behind your back. I, like, I, uh, this. I never get <laughs> coffee. So this is saying something. Um, but I like, I just, in a year's time, I mean, that, and I'm not, I know I'm always careful when the things are recording. I don't want to offend people. Right. Um, but I think for a lot of us, mm-hmm. $1,500, you, you wouldn't even know where that went mm-hmm. in your budget when you look back mm-hmm. over a year's time. Mm-hmm. Um, which I keep thinking, you're dumb, Travis, because... You spend money on stuff that... <laughs> you slurp down your coffee. Is there sugar in that one? Just curious. It's all sugar. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, it's like 99% <laughs> sugar. It's like 120 grams of carbs there, just like my drink yesterday. Yeah. Oh, you can't no, this thing things. is just straight sugar. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but like I was like thinking like marketing stuff for you guys. Like, here's how much a person spends on this. And then almost explaining the non-benefits of like that and then like here's how much you would spend and like explaining what this is Mm -hmm. because honestly yes once you start to understand it it's like well that's a no-brainer yeah that's because most of us got a hundred bucks or so a month um especially for something as important as i wish it was laid out like the amount of money that you spend on stupid things was laid out as easy as the time as the screen time is on your iphone you click on (laughs) it and you're like oh Oh. shit i'm spending six (laughs) hours a day (laughs) on my screens and i'm (laughs) bitching to myself that i'm not hanging out with my daughter you know know. what i'm saying it's like i wish that (laughs) the way that we spent our money was laid out like that so you'd be like oh this will be easy i'll just take the money right out of here and just and then giant track it with your face. blood sugar <laughs> over the course of time. This is what your blood sugar and insulin resistance is doing, yeah. right? Just killing myself faster, <laughs> wasting time. And sugary coffee drinks. <laughs> yeah. Oof. No, no judgment here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was actually going to ask the question as you grow, mm-hmm. um, because it is so tailored and specific and like, Hey, if you get me, you get me type yeah. of thing. And you're selling that right now. Like mm-hmm. that, like for someone like me, if I'm like, okay, so I'm really going to get to know you and you're really going to get to know, and you're yep. my person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and my experience has been, but that always changes. 
And is that going to like, so yeah. you guys get more successful and you grow and mm -hmm. like, what are those? Because everything we do as these things grow, it's new challenges or maybe something we didn't really think about or, mm -hmm. you know, you guys have to hire more people. Would it, will it be tough to hire more, um, nurse practitioners? Uh, is your, is the other person a doctor or practice practitioner? Nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioner. Yeah. Um, do you think it'll be difficult to hire them away from the system, if you will, or the, well, do you want to answer this one? Yeah. So I, I like think you've... that what we would, what, how we envision this going forward is not that we necessarily hire, hire more providers, but that we inspire providers mm -hmm. to come out of the system and open their own clinics to give people mm. options for this because to decentralize it is part of its beauty because mm -hmm. then each practice has its own personality. Mm -hmm. And so if more providers can do their own practices and keep their, pra and keep their panels small, instead of Phoenix rising, becoming some corporate mm -hmm. monster that loses all of these benefits to just knowing the doc that you have. Um, I think it'd be much better to just inspire docs to do this on their own. So we've like toyed with the idea of mentoring. I, we've kind of naturally already been doing mentoring for mm -hmm all physicians so far, actually mm -hmm. pediatricians and some, um, intensive, intense internal medicine, internal medicine, which is really interesting. So we have MDs coming and they're like, you're still alive. It's been six years. I'm like <laughs> treading water, you know, but, and um, then the next time they come, they got their notebook out. Okay. How did you do <laughs> right? it? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. And so it's like, wow, like they're, as we said before, it's a system that creates the misery, right? Like the system's broken, but we have great providers in our area. They're just not being allowed to shine yeah. and it, and the patient is suffering and the providers work-life balance is suffering. So what Joel was saying, you know, like I, Phoenix rising is going to stay rigid with the, the core value of, you know, um, uh, access to care. So our patients having access to care, the partnership, right, between the patient and the provider. So we're navigating through this together. Um, and then provider autonomy, um, and which, in, you know, includes how we practice um, and, you know, my schedule. No one will control my schedule. I choose my work-life balance because that's the biggest reason why people um, have burnout in primary care. So um, with that, you know, I, I – it's a very tricky thing to, when you think about growing and expanding, it becomes so much more complicated when you're trying to pull together different personalities and different values and goals and, um, and being able to do that and still maintain like the, the beauty of, of what it is that we have, I think would be challenging. Um, and so we've, we've thought about that a lot and then kind of where Joel's going is, is if we can maybe coach, mentor and inspire and, and, consulting maybe like consulting with people like mm -hmm. just how I want to empower my patients so mm -hmm. that they're not you know they can take that into their own life us empowering other practitioners like you don't need all these big systems um I say that and then I'm like I hope nobody comes and tries to <laughs> shut me down you know I'm like okay be nice to me people but it's for the patient yeah um yeah. that that you know we everybody has something unique to offer. Like, you know, like I was saying, Danny may not be the right provider right. for you, but there are plenty. The pie is so huge. I don't need the whole pie. I don't have to monopolize the whole pie. I right. will fail myself and you if right. I try to do that. Yeah. So keep it small and, and just create a whole bunch of different slices of a bunch of different types of pies. And then it enriches the community and, and providers can do what they wanted to do from the beginning yeah. and the patient and community benefits. Yeah. Right yeah. now we're trying to add what, add things to the clinic that support the provider. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be adding mental health services, hopefully at the end of 2023, mm -hmm. I'll be getting out of school for that. Boom. And then we'll have you know, a mental health provider and primary care at the same clinic. And that would, I think be really powerful health for coaching people. Programming. Yeah, yeah. I guess there's that. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right now <laughs> doing uh mindset coaching for people. Mm -hmm. So basically using cognitive behavior therapy techniques to help folks kind of understand the, how that they, the way that they think about things affects the way that they feel about things mm -hmm. and helping them understand if we can change that and, and using empathy and some techniques to, help them change the way they, they think about situations so that they change the way they feel. Yeah. Um, but eventually adding in the ability to prescribe psychotropics and 
hopefully psychedelics at the end of 2023 gotcha. um, to do, to really help with the mental health because none of these changes happen unless someone's mind is in it. And if they can't get their mind in it, then there's none of these change, none of these healthy habits are going to even come to fruition. Yeah. That bumping up against that process resistance or outcome resistance. So there's like what I do, I feel like it's almost all psych. Um, and it trying to help people work through those barriers and the process of like, you're saying you want this goal, but I'm also hearing you say you don't want to go on a walk. Mm. Right. So that's like mm-hmm. process resistance. And then, you know, you're, what's an outcome resistance example. I'm just like, well, outcome would be scared to scared to be, feel good, there even go. though you're still in a scary situation. Yeah. Mm. That would be outcome resistance. Just okay. like kind of a weird thing to think about, but it's very it's there. It's a real thing for people. So, so that's part of why we're like, I, you know, I'm like, I need, again, I can't be the best at everything. Right. We all have our niche. And I'm like, I have so much, um, there's so much resistance in primary care, you know, because we're a whole person interconnected. Um, that includes psych. And, and I know there's a lot of stigma around that. Um, but we need that resource. So Joel with the mindset coaching, um, and then going to get his psychiatric NP. And then another part of that too, is we're just very impassioned about educating the community. So putting on presentation for small businesses, like let's say we have a business we work with right now, um, who brought up that they have, um, concerns about their staff having mental health issues and addiction issues. So then they called and they're like, Hey, can we have an owner's meeting? The owners of these businesses got together and asked me to come and talk with them and kind of go through like, Hey, this is what depression and addiction looks like. And they're like, I think that's our problem with our Mm. culture and our, and our, and Mm -hmm. our employees. And we love them and we don't want them to leave. So then I'm like, okay, here's some resources. And they just, that having the ability to like, okay, my patient, you know, my patients are fine. I can block this day. I can go and help my community, um, and those employers or go and do, um, different, we're doing with these rise Phoenix rising family medicine rise presentations where we go to courthouse. And I would talk about, um, uh, metabolic risk, right? So like heart disease and diabetes. So having the flexibility, that's just something we're passionate about. But when you create this model with different people owning their own brand, owning their own strength and model, you get so many other options in the community, you know, but yeah, I was just thinking like, (laughs) in terms of the growth thing and you were like, well, we kind of want to stay smaller, Mm -hmm. um, to control a lot Mm -hmm. of those quality things. I mean, Olga and I are kind of the same way. We don't really have intentions to like have a bunch of employees one day and get really big, um, because of our nature and kind of what we want it to be. Um, but then I was thinking kind of like the franchise idea, like Mm -hmm. you're saying, like they come back, how'd you guys, you're six years in, you're still here. You guys must have figured something out, um, but almost like you guys are doing it and learning all these things Mm -hmm. and eventually you might be able to create a model where as people like you get into it with for certain ideas and like and then like, oh, this is not it. Like there's got to be a different way. And then you guys are like, here's the model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether they keep the the same name Phoenix Rising Mm -hmm. or you guys are like, no, you can have your own name, but, you know, you're still like, here's the model and consulting and Mm -hmm. helping them start and do their own thing. Like, that's what I was thinking. I love that. We have a little bit more of doing to do before we have something (laughs) like that really dialed in. I think probably in the next 12 months, that's something that we've thought about and probably will go ahead and start doing something like that, but we need to do the do first. Yeah. Joel would say, that's step number three, Danny. <laughs> Can you please focus on step number one? That's probably yeah. a weekly conversation. Yeah. No, that's, why, that's where I feel like I would see you guys uh, potentially loving that process of mm-hmm. um, like where you were at and how you were feeling. And then if you can go do that for other people, Mm -hmm. like, Hey, actually there is a different way we've done it. We have the blueprint. Yeah. Um, and then however that's structured business wise and flowing through you guys or whatever that is, um, and having people start their own thing. And like, cause really, there's, <clears throat> there's probably a lot of people, um, and I know me and Olga feel the same way about starting our own thing and how this is worked out and whatnot. And we go through a guy that kind of lets us have access and to what we do. Um, but then I'm thinking and how, 
happy that's made us like we can actually have our own thing. Um, but, but before that, like I had thought, like, I don't think we could do it. Like, I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that blueprint is, but then to be the people that Mm -hmm. are like going to these people that are burnt out or whatever, like, this is what I thought it was. And like, Hey, there's another way that would probably be awesome. I mean, eventually when you guys have that model, one of the, the thing, the number one thing that makes this thing successful is her, it's her personality. It's the way that she connects with people. So not every provider can do something like this, regardless of how bad they want to do it. They have to have that special piece about their character, character that gets them out there grinding in the community Mm -hmm. that really, they really care about the connection between them and their patient because this thing, yes, will make good money. And yes, you'll have a good, you know, work life balance. But if you don't care about that patient provider relationship, yeah. this thing will fall apart. Yeah. You know, and you really got to tease that out before you mm-hmm. go and someone just buys your, your idea, you know, right. Because it's so important to maintain that relationship for folks, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I was saying like the people like you mm-hmm. that got right. into it for a certain reason. And then like, this isn't it, totally. you know, mm-hmm. cause there's, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty that, They love what they're doing and they don't, you know, but there's probably others that had a different idea of what it was going to be, but then feel stuck or I don't, I wouldn't even know the first thing, how to start Mm -hmm. it or which that could probably be rad to like mentor that. And it would be so amazing. I know when we've done it this little bit, I get so impassioned and, and excited and, and then I have to like think back, like okay, step number one. Joel's like step number one, right? Like because the options are just totally. Well, we, before endless. this, we were doing a nonprofit called Alluvium, and we were working oh, yeah. with homeless, and we were sending primary care services down in the homeless camps. Yeah, I think I really want to get back to that. Yeah. I really want to get back to going down in those camps, helping people down there, and connecting all the resources in Salem with those people and be in that connection for them. Because not a lot of providers want to actually go down in those camps coming from a military background with the, with the experience that I have, I have mm-hmm. no problem in those environments at all. Neither does Danielle. Mm-hmm. And so going, working in those camps at right at those people's tent doors and then bringing and bringing them up to the resources that are in the community, I think is our next passion. It's, it seems like it's heavy on our heart yeah. and it's something that we dabbled in. Yeah. And unfortunately it kind of fell apart when we stepped away from it. And so we want to get back into it and get it back on its feet. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, as you were discussing, like, oh, you guys might really like this. And then he brought that up. I'm like, you know, I think we like creating systems, like efficient systems that bring something empowering to humans. Right. And and part of like that experience with Alluvium, I went in there with what I thought was like, OK, here's a homeless situation. Right. And then once I got in there, I was like, holy shit, I have no idea. Like what is going on? And then the longer I was in there, I'm like, Oh my gosh, this really is so much more complicated than what I realized. And, and then being able to go and start figuring out the different systems in our community that are in place to serve that situation. It was like the unfolding of all the kind of like roadblocks and maybe lack of communication or lack of partnership. And I'm like, what are we doing? Like we could do this so much better, you know? And it's all a matter of like, um, me thinking like, well, who, who are these people really serving? What's the agenda? What's the priority? Where's there a communication need or a resource need and trying to fit those pieces together? Um, because I certainly learned a lot. Um, I, I have always known I'm a compassionate person, but I certainly became humbled and more compassionate after having that experience. Um, though I do still see that there's something about what we're doing that's not helping. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to be done there too. Yeah. Two things. Yeah. First thing, thank you for your service. No, you're welcome. Second thing, um, do you talk about that at all? Mm-hmm. Is of course. It, mm-hmm. So, so what did you do? When, oh. when did you do it? <laughs> it all started in 2001. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I grew up, um, small town, New Iberia, Louisiana. And, okay. uh, my mom and dad were both Navy corpsmen. Um, but they were on shifts. That's what I heard about. And so I was not doing well in high school and I knew I needed to do something in Louisiana. The oil industry is a big deal. So I thought I'd join the Navy, get into underwater diving and uh, do underwater welding for the uh, oil industry. So I joined the Navy as a, um, underwater, um, EOD doing explosive ordnance. 
Well, when I got through boot camp, the job was full. And I joined in um, July of 2001, so there was nothing going on. I was going to go into explosive ordnance, learn how to do underwater stuff, and then get out. Well, I got in, and uh, 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, they asked me to switch my job to a medic. And so I changed mm. over to a Navy corpsman, thinking, oh, yeah, mom and dad were that. I'll just be on a ship. There's no problem. This will be awesome. Four years, get my school paid for, get my life together. Well... When 9-11 happened, my drill instructor asked, who's going to be corpsman? And I said, well, that would be me. He said, well, you're going to be right in the middle of this. And I was like, well, how is that possible? I'm going to be on a ship. He's like, oh, they didn't tell you. The Navy <laughs> corpsman, Surprise. they go with the Marines as medics. And I was like, oh, shit. So my first, my first unit was the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, a weapons company. And I mm. got deployed to Iraq. Um, we didn't see a lot of combat that first deployment. It was basically just holding down an airfield while we were, um, about a couple of weeks. And then we got out with a couple of shots here and there, but no, none of my guys got hurt. You know, it was, it was the dream. I mean, guy, guys were popping shots off, you know, guys, were, <laughs> you know, they were just like, yeah. I, it's hard to talk about it a little bit because it sounds, you sound crazy where you're like, yeah, we were just like popping guys yeah. off here and there. Yeah. But and so <laughs> <laughs> luckily none of us got hurt. You know what I mean? Gosh. And so I, we come home and then my next deployment is to Hadith, Iraq. Well, Haditha um, was going on. This was in the beginning of 2004 when they did the first push to Fallujah, Iraq and Marines didn't quite get through the entire city. We had to back out because they were doing those crazy things to those security agents and everything. Well, then we did a second push in Fallujah, and that was in November. And they tasked the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, to go right up the middle of the city. Mm. And so um, in November 2004, I was with a unit of Marines that went right through the middle of Fallujah, Iraq. And that was 30 days of sustained combat. That was, you know, wow. we were doing quick reaction forces where we were going and getting the guys, you know, SEALs or Marines or anyone that would get hurt. We'd go in. We were the unit tasked to get those guys out. Uh, provide medical care, get them stabilized. Had a couple of guys come very close to dying. I was very, very lucky that none of my Marines died. They did get hurt, um, but was able to get out of that pretty, you know, scratch free. But it didn't, it scratched my mind. Mm -hmm. it, it really fucked with my head. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize how bad or what PTSD was until went through my first divorce. And I was like, what? was that why am i why can't i connect with her you know why can't i connect with my kids and mm. kind of realizing what ptsd really is and how it affects the way that you can have relationships because you're so on edge and you're so vigilant about everything yeah mm -hmm. and um ended up taking about a year or so to just for myself kind of like um you know just find out who i was how i fucked up that relationship and then i got with danielle and We've been through some horrible st things ourselves, but my PTSD hasn't been a factor for this. You know, it's been, um, and trauma affects us in different ways. Like, you know, I, I've had PTSD from combat, but I've also had PTSD from divorce. Yeah. Right. I've had yeah. PTSD from the threats of DHS and the threats of custody and having your kids taken away mm -hmm. and betrayal and all those things are traumatic. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to get over those things too. And they're exact, it's exactly the same type of trauma as what combat causes. And so realizing those connections, I kind of take that, I took that insight and I was like, you know, I was able to get through that. Mm -hmm. I want to help people get through that now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm taking that experience and hopefully with the help of psychedelics in the future to kind of help people get through trauma and get mm -hmm. through their mental health issues to kind of help them get on their feet. And that's, that's, what I'm up to now. Will you, um, as you're out spreading the word on what you guys do, um, will you speak on that? Yeah. Um, you know, if we have mental health type topics, then I will. It's, you know, it's, it's so intense. I mean, it's such an intense story. It's kind of hard to bring it to play. Yeah. But when I'm with a one-to-one -one with a patient, yeah. it comes up, okay. especially dudes. Yeah. Um, because guys have a really hard time of, of opening up yep. and they have a hard time of understanding what or how stress and depression and anxiety is playing a role in their lives with their relationships. And they have a hard time understanding 
why their wives aren't talking to them or why they feel their wives feel like they aren't communicating with them or aren't listening to them and they feel uh, inadequate. And, you know, bringing up these stories of my own stories is what is the screwdriver I use to open them up. And so that's when it really comes out. Yeah, because I, I was just thinking like, like hearing all those things and then the space you're looking to go into with mental health space. Like for me, I've been divorced um, and co-parent and whatnot. And just thinking like, you know, if I'm meeting with you, um, that connectivity of like, you've been through it as mm-hmm. like, you're not just saying these things or right. you read about them or whatnot. Like you've experienced these mm-hmm. things, had the hurdles, had to overcome or still overcoming some mm-hmm. or um, you're living it yep. with mm-hmm. what you're you know yeah i think like firefighters police police officers they have mm-hmm. such a hard time opening up their pandora's box because they just feel like no one understands what they're going through and it's a blessing you know people say that war makes you worse but war makes you actually better and it makes you so that you can connect with these humans and it actually makes you appreciate what we have around us right and so the guys that go through these traumas, like firefighters, police, police officers, mm-hmm. guys that have been through divorce, any trauma, I mean, any trauma, I'm connected with these types of things because this is what I've connected with. But any trauma, if you can find meaning in that, then that's where you can really find the healing. And so that's the whole point of this is to help people find the meaning in their, in their suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, like you said, especially for dudes, you know, whether it's the culture society mm-hmm. that we all just kind of like, well, we don't talk about that. We keep that in, mm-hmm. which is so unhealthy mm-hmm. um, and c- can create so many other bad things yeah. from that. That's super important. Yeah. And, you know, guys for emotions, it all comes out as anger. Yeah. And so there, but there's so much more, there's yeah. so much nuance in that anger yeah. that they could really tap into. And find meaning in that. Like, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of emotion behind that in that passion that is very meaningful for them. And if they can find that, it just transforms them. Yeah, man, you guys are doing good stuff. And then medically, why I love the fact that there's going to be like this team team up kind of approach. Um, men who've been through that and women in, in their own way as well. Yeah. Um, when you have trauma or you have um, traumatic brain injuries, right? Like explosives and things like that, that changes your brain. Mm-hmm. And so um, there can be a lot of hormone dysfunction. So I work with a lot of police officers and firefighters and, I don't know if I have a single one that has a normal testosterone. Mm. And so when that's part of that whole person, health and wellness is having them come in and they're like, I'm tired. Uh, you know, I'm drinking too much and I'm smoking and I don't want to be smoking like all of these things. And I'm like, okay, so we, I have the opportunity to sit with them in that. And they, they start sharing those things with me. And then I'm like, so there's a lot that we're unpacking here. There's a lot of things that we need to do. Um, medically, I, I need to do a hormone panel. I need to check metabolics and inflammatory markers. And then I can start putting that care plan together. Meanwhile, I'm like, also, you should talk to my husband. Like mm-hmm. we, that we can start working on some of that mental health component and some of that processing because you're, you have a lot of trauma that you're trying to work through. Our bodies want to heal. You just have to have the right tools and it has to be normalized. Like realizing the stomach ache you get and all of that is because you actually have a nerve from your brain to your belly button and back to your heart. And no wonder you have an actual stomach ache, right? Like helping especially men, I think, but connect that mind body connection. And like, you're not crazy. You yeah. know, there's nothing wrong with you. Your body's functioning to protect you it's yeah. actually doing a beautiful thing yeah. so let's help it just be more efficient and do it to where you're not so miserable and you can connect with your wife and be intimate again and all of these things yeah. you know yeah i was just thinking about like what a compliment it is because like you said like low testosterone where someone might think like man this is all mental but then it's like well actually mm-hmm. it's not cuz here's what this level is mm-hmm. and here's where it should be mm-hmm. which like for someone like me i would be like okay so i'm not crazy there's actually like a physical mm-hmm. whatever um or vice versa like yes. with with hey this this thing and then this is why like i'm thinking this like tying those things together that like it might 
because someone, I think it could be easy to like get stuck on like it's this, but then like, no, 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 there's another part to this too. Yep. Like we have to work on all of this to tackle this. Mm-hmm. It's not just this, this one fix, yep. mm-hmm. you know, because even if you get this right and this is still off, mm-hmm. you're going to feel some kind of way or think some kind of way or yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think almost everybody I meet we, everybody has a wounded story. There's always, I don't know. I would say it's rare that somebody comes in and they don't have a significant trauma. And most often it's brushed over or I find out about it way appointments down the road. And I'm like, wait, you were raped at 16. Yeah. And they're like, well, yeah, but you know, I'm 50 now. And I'm like, no, let's back up. Like, (laughs) you know, these different uses and these experiences and everything we hold them in our body. Like that's just, we're just these energetic, amazing beings and, um, and just helping nudge the body and all of its interconnection into a a better place with different tools is liberating for people. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that self-compassion people, we tend to not be very compassionate towards ourselves. So yeah. Hardest on ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. (laughs) man I was just like you made the comment about someone saying like I was raped when I was young Uh and I I chuckled because um I I laugh at these things that are super important like Mm -hmm. me feeling dumb like Mm -hmm. I don't have a doctor Mm -hmm. (laughs) how stupid is that Mm -hmm. but like how we tell ourselves or or we hide these things or cover these things up or like well I'm 50 now well that doesn't change anything Mm it still happened it's still there like you know like that's really important mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> like to talk about and figure out and process through. Um, and just how, I don't know, just that societal thing, like what we were talking about. Like if we posted about how healthy we were, spent so much time with my family, that was the post mm-hmm. yeah. rather than check out I'm in Hawaii right now yeah. on a yacht or, you or, if, know. or if guys felt comfortable saying I'm angry, but actually I was crying with my wife, you know what I yeah. mean? And mm-hmm. I was connecting with her and this is how I did it. I think it's, it's, it's so, it's such a shame that we don't understand what emotions are and what, what they mean to us. You know, yeah. we're just left with mad and anger mm-hmm. and that's it. That's right. all we got, you know? And, Whereas there's so much nuance back behind that thing and to normalize it would really set a lot of people into healing. Heck yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of compassion missing for men and because they process things differently than women. Um, like for just a piece for my sharing of myself, I, I was raped when I was 17 and before that I'd had a lot of, um, sexual abuse from a teacher. Um, and, and navigating through that, like having all of that guilt and shame for me, you know, it became this dark, ugly secret that I didn't tell anybody for a couple of years. And then as I've worked through counseling and, and different healing and things like that, I mean, I'm 37. This happened when I was a teenager. Right. And I still go to counseling once a month, like, and it's not directly, it's not like I I haven't talked about those things anymore. That's been like way processed, but it's really interesting that something that's really traumatizing in my life currently, like with custody issues, right? Um, that the, something that has been causing me a lot of suffering for the last two years and a lot of fear with, with, um, conflict with exes and, and custody and things like that is this like guttural, you know, sense of like, okay, um, something feels dangerous. It feels unsafe and it involves my kids. Mm-hmm. Like I, I just want to, fucking unleash yeah. hell and fury, right? Yeah. Like no one's going to mess with my kids. Right. And then as I process that and I work with my counselor, I'm like, "Huh. Okay. This isn't the same situation as when I was 16, 15, right? And um and and because that's not the situation, I can then say, "Oh my gosh, all of this like this rage and this sense of like hypervigilance. Like I've mm-hmm. had hypervigilance for 2 years, right? Um wow, okay. I can now tell myself, like, remember, this isn't what's what happened to you as a teenager. Yeah. This isn't what's happening to your kids. It's just triggering and it reminds you d- deep on a subconscious level. I didn't even realize this. I'm telling you this. You're like the 
second person I've told this to. Um, and because I just realized this, like my husband was person number one. Actually, we are I, on a podcast. I know. I know. There's I more than care. two people that know right? that. <laughs> I'm an open book. But, but that's like part of the like awareness of like, man, that's something I thought I kind of put to rest. Yeah. And in so many different ways I have, and I've healed through that. Like, talk to me 10 years ago and I'd be crying to you right now talking about it. Right. So it was yeah. a very fresh unprocessed trauma, yep. but here we are at this point in time. And now the empowerment in this is knowing like I've talked about this, I can face this, you know, I've survived this. And, and I bring that in just like Joel was saying, I can bring that into women in the clinic. I can say, you have a, Oh, you have um, struggles with food. Tell me more about that. Oh, you, you have a binge restrictive eating disorder. And immediately, immediately I'm like, have you ever had any kind of an abuse so far for my patient panel? A hundred percent of the time wow. it's yes. Mm. Right. Wow. And so then it's like, let's get you connected. Right. And people just have such a hard time seeing that connection. So for me, custody wound down to the night that I was raped mm. and having a fear of death. Right. Mm. And, and, and for whatever reason that was, a, that was a subconscious link that I had. And now when I have an interaction with an attorney or, or, you know, this other co-parenting situation, right. I can be like, no, my kids are safe. This yeah. is complicated and it's yeah. between adults, but my kids are safe, yeah. but they're the most important thing to me in the entire planet. So when it feels like there's danger going on for whatever reason, danger in my mind linked up to that night, it's just yeah. fascinating. Yeah. You know, it's just so interesting. So I think with, with, you know, with gentlemen, there's, there's even more complication with like cultural expectations for processing emotion. Right. And anger is such an uncomfortable emotion. I even have to like check myself when Joel's angry. I'm like, Whoa, like that's a lot, right? Like for whatever reason. And we've talked about this and he said like, why is it okay that you can cry and be a big old, you know, blah, 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 cause I'll be, I'm a crier, mm -hmm. but I can't be pissed, you know? And I'm like, that's a great question. Like, <laughs> why is it more comfortable? But then, you know, and so it's sort of like, how can we have some acceptance for, for that situation and being able to lean into that and say, okay, what's going on there? So we figured out what Danny's link is and what's going on there. So let's figure it out for these firefighters, paramedics, military. Yeah. Um, there's so much suffering, you yeah. know, and it's no, no, it's all suffering. Yeah. You know, nobody's is worse or better than the other people like to rate their suffering. I'm like, this is absurd. Like, yeah. Oh, it's not, I was raped, but it wasn't as bad as this person. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. I, I went yeah. to war, but like Joel said, but nobody in my platoon or sorry, I get the word wrong. Nobody in my group died. Right. right? And I'm like, but that does nothing to minimize your experience and your trauma. Right. So anyway, we yeah, can talk cause, cause he said this. that and, and I'm, I'm like thinking like, <laughs> yeah it still seems like super crazy <laughs> to me though right like, i know <laughs> regardless I know. if no one died like right? you guys are shooting at each other <laughs> <laughs> that was a possibility right? like, i know i know yeah. you listen to it and it's interesting like firefighter paramedic or a cop like yeah i had this call and they are wrecked they are wrecked when they come to see me and yeah. in the process we're minimizing it. it i don't know why i can't pull it together i don't know why i can't do this job everybody else around me can so and so had a call that was so much worse like that story that we tell ourselves yeah. is so it's perpetuating a major problem so yeah. our goal is to help people unravel all of that and heal from it yeah but wow that came a long way from phoenix rising right like but it's all Honestly, interconnected like i so appreciate you guys sharing that i mean you never telling anyone other than him i mean the the heart of this whole thing i have thought how neat would it be to have a platform where people could share or would feel comfortable to share that yeah. because someone listening or watching mm -hmm. is like so resonating mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, story is so important. Yep. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why like when you, you ask like, are you having fun with this? And it's like, I can't even describe what I'm feeling because I see so many positive things that can come out of story and hearing people's story and i mean like you know you're talking about well he gets mad and you cry like i'm like 
that's me and Adrian. <laughs> like, you know, like, and, and then there's relatability. Like, yeah. We're not the only ones. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, so literally like that part was like the heart of all of this. Mm-hmm. It, 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 yes, we will talk about the business or we'll talk about whatever that person does, but the real meaning behind it would be if people would be comfortable enough to like share these things because we know that like that's where it's at like Mm -hmm. that's where change can happen that's that's where the impact can happen um where that vulnerable piece of like you know man it felt scary to like i've never really said that to anyone and now i said it you know to potentially a lot of people (laughs) um but like you have no idea like Mm -hmm. who that might resonate with or where that might go or I don't know. I just, you like, I think about like, there might be someone that, you know, was raped. That was like, I was about to commit suicide, Mm -hmm. you know? And then I listened to this person, Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe I didn't, or Mm -hmm. I mean, any of those kind of stuff. And because of the story Mm -hmm. and probably somewhat healing for you to like, Mm -hmm. I talked about that, you know, and I don't know that, that that is for me like that's where the gold's at is like that's the point like that is the cool part um so thank you for of sharing course, those. Man. because well, yeah. like i know we, like i joke and i laugh and stuff but like i do that because i know how heavy it is yeah because you know having riley draw that sign um i'll never forget because uh sh- she you know right now she doesn't really care because she's 11 she's like whatever but one day she's gonna think that it's cool that she did that um but when she drew it she was like well it's kind of messy and it's not perfect and Mm -hmm. she's kind of like me a perfectionist Mm -hmm. and and i was like exactly exactly because the stories all of our stories are a bit messy all of it And, Mm -hmm. and and it was funny like how unperfect she thought that was. And I'm like, that's so perfect because I'm hoping that that's what we get into is Mm -hmm. some like those kind of conversations. And I know, I know not everyone, you know, will feel comfortable to go that deep or whatnot, but like, I mean, this is just me talking like almost off air. Like Mm -hmm. that was what I like for me, that's the stuff that's like, that's awesome. That's Mm. like, that's what, that's life. That's like real. Yeah. That's like what gives me life. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. this whole thing is like, yeah, I, I've been putting a ton of time into it, but it's, it's weird. Like putting a ton of time into something that's giving back to you. Mm -hmm. Um, how much different that feels than like putting a ton of time that's not really feeding you or your soul. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. Well, you're welcome. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Yeah. This is awesome. Good. First podcast appearance. Boom. Yay. Boom. <laughs>